Well, good morning, Providence. Isn't it a beautiful sanctuary we have come into this morning? Always love this time of year uh, and just just the beauty of it, hanging of the greens. Yahweh, meaning I am that I am. God's name as he revealed it to Moses. And what a wonderful name that is. Meaning, in essence, that it, he, our God, transcends all the laws which he has made. There is no such thing as gravity to God, no physics, no biology. There's nothing that God is bound by, for he made all things, and all things are in subject, or are subject to him. And that is our God. That is Yahweh, and we are so glad for it. Because if we had a God who was bound by anything, he wouldn't be much of a God at all. And if we were not bound by those things which he had made, we wouldn't be very good subjects to God. So, he has kept all things in perfect order. Yahweh, our God. Let us stand and praise his holy name. Uh, hymn number set 277, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. <laughs> with us as we pray together. Father, we just thank you for the fact that there was a host of angels in the sky who heralded the coming of the Christ child into our lives because that means so much to us today. Oh God, we thank you for the very name Yahweh. I am the great creator. We thank you that that's not just some name, some entity far away and distant from us, but it is a, 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 a person in the person of the Godhead who loves us and cares for us and nurtures us and seeks for us to love him in return and to care for him and to be in relationship. Lord, what, what a wonderful privilege that is to be called sons of the living God. Oh, Lord, we just thank you now for this time of worship, this time of prayer and praise. And we ask you, oh, God, to minister to us and feed us during these days when we again welcome the Christ child into our lives and our hearts. We do this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 
version. Standing again, let us sing our fellowship chorus, All Hail King Jesus. gathered in his house this morning to worship him. Let us then sing a joyful song as we continue in our praise and in our worship and in our reverence to him. Thank you. 
thanking for that one Yeshua Jesus who came to save us from our sins. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Holy Father, we just cannot come into your presence with enough gratitude and praise and thanksgiving to have you understand, accept that you are God and know all things, the true depth of gratitude in our hearts for Jesus who came to save us from our sins. Father, we thank you for this time of worship, this time of praise, this time of thanksgiving and adoration. Lord, we lift up to you songs and words and prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Father, we just continue to pray for uh, so many of our number today who are uh, not with us because of illness. Father, whatever that illness might be, we just lift them up to you and pray for them. Others, Father, who are distant and far from us because they can uh, do no longer live among us because of illness. Lord, we just pray for them today. Other Father, that uh, we know bear the burden of grief as we come to this holiday season. Lord, we just pray for them. Lord, we continue to pray for this church and the work that we do here. Lord, uh, we just uh, continue to hold out and pray for that next generation of church leaders. Lord, in our hearts and in our minds, we can see them. We know they're there. We have a vision of them. Lord, we just pray for them. We pray that you would help us to nurture them and care for them as they come to us. And as this church begins to become once again the perpetual light upon a hill that speaks your name in this community. Oh God, we pray for the work of this church, the work of this congregation. Lord, we pray for our search committee as they continue the task of finding that one that you have laid your hand upon to pass through this congregation. Oh God, I pray for that committee. I lift them up today. I lay hands upon them in the Spirit of God that you would anoint them with the power and the presence of your Spirit that boldly your Spirit might come upon them that your guidance might be in them, that your omnipotent mind might take theirs and guide them in that way that only you would have them go. That this church might bloom and blossom and grow in your presence. Anoint this whole task and each one that has anything to do with it power of your spirit. Lord, we pray today for our young men and women who serve this country. Some of those who are far from us today in fields of battle. Lord, we pray for their, their protection and their care. We pray for your nurturing spirit upon them. Lord, we pray for our missionaries, especially those, Father, this time of year who serve in, in international fields far from their homeland on, on the uh, far corners of this globe. Lord, in places many times that are so dangerous that they cannot know, we cannot know who they are. Uh, their true identity cannot be told. Lord, we pray for them, for their protection as they seek to give all that they have to give up dreams that the rest of us hold dear because their dream is the perpetuation of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Holy Father, we pray your spirit and your blessing on this service. We lift it up to you as a sacred offering in your presence. Forgive us of all of those things that keep us from being at your feet and worshiping you today. 
In Jesus' name. Scott made the comment to me this morning by text that he was coming by the church to turn the heat on so it would be toasty warm. <laughs> For those of you that don't know anything about texting, there's a little thing called LOL. It's laugh out loud. I LOL'd him back because it is definitely toasty warm in here now. <laughs> Let us stand together and sing in all of our toasty warmness. <laughs> Hymn number 132, join all the glorious names. day, Lord. Thank you for the beauty of it. Thank you for this time, Lord, we come to you here to hear your word. And Lord, as we come to this part of the service that we give back a portion that he has graciously given us, Lord, just take it and use it wisely in the better of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, Natasha is going to have our uh, film pulled up. And let me say just a word about this, if I could, before it begins to play. Is uh, Each Sunday throughout December, we hope during this time to bring you a clip from our International Mission Board uh, on the work. I, I want it to be personal to you, what it is that our Lottie Moon dollars are going to do and, and who they're going to support out in the mission field. With that being said, Natasha, would you give us our first clip, please? How in the world did a small country boy end up here? You know, I come from a small town in Texas, and I would have never in a million years thought that I would end up first in the Amazon jungle, and then in Africa, you're trying to, you know, carry your water, you're trying to cook your meals, you're trying to study your, your Bible, learn your stories, learn your language, and then something else happens. This man had gone to the witch doctor and began to place curses on our team, on Jeremy. But we know that 
that those have no power over us. You know, we all asked ourselves, what is it going to take for us to stay? Because leaving wasn't an option. So yes, we will endure sickness and isolation and all the you know, things that go along with doing what we do. However, Christ is worth it. Yes, it's difficult sometimes, but then we look around and we say, wow, we live in the middle of Africa surrounded by warriors every night just about. We hear them beating on drums and dancing. We're able to see people come to Christ that have no hope in their lives and they've never heard of Jesus. And some, a few, have been willing to change their lives. And we want for them to be equipped no matter the price that they will be required to pay. And if we sent them out alone, then they would not make it because they wouldn't be able to stand. But if we send them out as the church, then they can stand against the world.
Brother Jerry, I just want you to know there's a little something in music called modulation. That's when we're in one key and suddenly the composer decides we need to sing in another key a little higher and another key a little higher and another key a little higher. There are about five or six modulations in that and I'm a tenor. By the end of that, we're screaming. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, and again, today as you turn to your scriptures, we just want to say to our folks who will see us this week by internet and other media how glad we are that you've joined us for worship this week, and we always invite you and want you to know that we pray for you as we do for each other. So God bless you in your visit with us this week by internet and other media. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a child is born to us. Therefore the Lord himself, Isaiah says, will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then if you'll flip right over in your scriptures to, verse, to chapter 9, beginning with verse 6, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness, from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Will you bow with me? Father, through and by the power of your Spirit, we pray your anointing presence on this word. That we might know and be subject to your Spirit and his sweet presence in this place today. Forgive us of all of that which impedes that from happening. In Jesus' name, amen. On the southern border of the empire of Cyrus, the great king of Persia, we've studied Cyrus on a number of other occasions, but there lived uh, a great chieftain in a province there on that southern border named Cagular who tore to shreds any of the groups, the detachments of Cyrus's army that he sent to defeat and to subdue, subdue uh, Cagular. Cagular would defeat them and simply tear them to shreds. And so finally the emperor Cyrus, amassing his entire army, marched down to uh, the, the uh, province that Cagular was uh, in charge of and captured him and brought him to the capital for execution there in the palace at the great city of Babylon. So on the day of the trial, he and his family were brought to the great judgment uh, chamber where Cyrus was seated. And Cagular, a fine looking man of well more than six feet, came into the presence with a noble manner about him, a magnificent specimen of a man. So impressed was Cyrus with this uh, man and his great appearance that he said to Cagular, what would you do, Cagular, should I spare your life? And Cagular, looking at the great king, the great emperor, said to him, your majesty, if you spare my life, I will go back to my province and serve you as your obedient servant as long as I live. Cyrus, impressed by that answer, went on to ask him, Cagular, what would you do if I spared the life of your wife? Your Majesty, great king of Persia, if you would but spare the, the life of my wife, I would gladly die for you. So moved was the great King Cyrus, and if you remember anything about our studies of the great King Cyrus, he was the one who allowed Israel to, to return to their land in Jerusalem, in Israel. 
in Judah. So moved was this great emperor that he freed both Cagular and his wife and family to return to their province so that Cagular could act as governor. And arriving back at home, Cagular was reminiscing to his wife about the events that they had just uh, gone through. And Cagular says to his wife, did you notice the great marble at the grand entrance of this palace? Did you notice the fine tapestry hanging on the walls all the way down the corridor to the throne room? And did you see the chair on which the emperor sat? Why, it must have been a lump of the purest gold carved just for the king. His wife could appreciate the excitement of Cagular and how impressed he was with it all, but she replied to him, I didn't notice any of that. Well, in complete amazement, Cagular says to his wife, well, what did you see? What did you look at? And she looked dead into his eyes and she said to him, I beheld the face of the man who loved me enough to say that he would give his life for me. That man I beheld. The question has plagued mankind down through the millennia. Really, all of the time that man has existed, since that day when sin took over our lives and we were cursed and driven from the Garden of Eden, the question has come, does God still love me? Does God love us? Does God care anything about me? Well, God answered that question before we even asked it. And so that we would see his answer, he sent a blistering bright star in the sky for us to see, to guide those who would follow him. So that we would hear his voice of love, he sent a chorus of angels from the eastern sky to split the night and sing a herald that the Christ child was coming. And so that we would believe it, God came to us and lived among us. The scripture tells us he became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus' birth was announced by prophets. It was announced by angels and wise men and shepherds and priests. And it was announced by God himself. So I want us to take just a few minutes this morning to look at this story. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And consider what that great love of God, that great love of all times has made possible for you and for me. First of all, it has made it possible for us to do something that Old Testament people found it very difficult to do, and that was to understand and comprehend God. Not that we can and not that we do fully, but we see him more vividly today than anyone has ever seen him. John chapter 1 verse 14, John writes these words. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And then John chapter 14, in an exchange that he has with his disciple Philip, when Philip is saying, well, show us who God is, Jesus. In John's scripture, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus' answer is, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me? has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I am the Father. I, he goes on in that same scripture to say, I and the Father am one. Jesus came that we might know who God is, that we might comprehend something of God and how God is, and that we might recognize God and begin to understand the magnitude of his love for us and how it never fails, and how it always exists. Jesus was God in the flesh, and the scriptures teach us that if we see Jesus, we've seen God the Father. 
Because he came, we can begin to, to comprehend who God is. And secondly, God came to us in the flesh so that every person, both before the time of his coming and after, might have an opportunity for atonement, to atone for their sins, available to all mankind. Paul writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Paul writes these words. He says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's so plain in verse 21. You and I once were alienated from God. We were enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free, free from accusation. Who can lay charge of my sin against me? No one, because Christ has forgiven me. The Bible teaches that, we've been, that we rebelled against God, that we came against Him, that we were obstinate against Him and willful, and that we violated His righteous and moral law, and that over and over again we walked away from Him, and that we are all guilty. We are all sinners. The Scripture teaches us that we have all sinned, and we all fall beneath the, the glory of God. And any effort to atone our sin, any effort to make that right, any effort to do something good in order that we might be saved to atone for ourselves is futile. When I am gone from this earth, if someone speaks a eulogy for me, if someone gives a testimony for me, if they say to you as a group of people, he was a good man, he did many good things. He must surely be in the presence of God. I hope the congregation breaks out in hysterical laughter because nothing could be further from the truth. There is nothing that I have done, nothing that I have ever been that warrants enough grace to save me and give me eternal life. But John 3.16 saves the day for me. Because it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because God came to us in the flesh, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how you've been, it says, whoever, whoever, he came that whoever believes in him shall not perish. God came in the flesh to redeem all mankind. His atonement is available to us all. And thirdly, because God came in the flesh, I can understand that he identifies with me. He knows what I'm going through. He knows the day-to-day -day problems that exist in my life. I cannot say to God when things have gone wrong and in my prayers, I can't say to him, well, God, you just don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through. I, I'm a human being. I'm here on this earth and you're almighty God in a sinless glory. You can't understand me. Well, yes, he can. And yes, he does, not, not just because he created me, not just because of his omnipotent glory, but because he has suffered all things just as I have suffered them through the man Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, what a wonderful scripture because it says to me that God cared about me enough to live as I live, to go through what I go through, to feel the pain and the suffering that I feel in this life, to be challenged by the temptation of sin as I am challenged. The writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, 
but we have one who has been tempted and tried and measured in all ways, in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Philippians, Paul writes in chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 7 through 8, he says, Rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. You see, God chose not to act like God. God chose, God was the master of the universe and he chose to become the greatest servant of the universe. God gave up the life that he knew in order to experience the life that I know, in order to live here in my likeness. He subjected himself to the same curse that you and I live under. Because you see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, when they were driven from the Garden of Eden, they experienced the curse of sin. God placed upon humankind the curse of sin. He said, you will work by the sweat of your brow. And, and uh, there were other things that he put in that curse. And he said, and you're going to live throughout the course of mankind on this earth under this curse. The curse of Adam. The curse of sin. And yet he chose to come and live here under that same curse that he put me under because of sin. Because he, he came in the flesh, he knows what I go through. He knows what I endure. He understands and he lives through the same heartaches and troubles and temptations that I live through every single day. He became like me so that I could become like him. He became like me so that I could become like him. That's not much of a trade-up value because I'm not much to become like. But I'm grateful that he was willing to humble and stoop himself down so low to be like me that he might raise me up to be in his likeness. And, and fourthly, he gave himself in the form of his son Jesus to become the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek so that he could always continually represent me at the throne of God. You see, because of sin, because the scripture says I was born in sin and steeped in iniquity, I have no right, I have no value to come to the throne of grace of God himself. There is no place at the throne of God for me because I was born in sin and steeped in iniquity. When I go to plead my case before God, the only word that I would hear was depart from me. Depart from me, you who worked iniquity. But because of the, of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, it changed all of that. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then, let us then, do something that we have not heretofore had the right to do, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, not with doubt, not with lack of conviction, but with confidence that you have a right to be there. You have uh, the permission to be there because of the shed blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And those of you who know me well enough know that I wouldn't dare walk through this without giving you that scripture that is so dear to my heart. When John teaches in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, My dear children, I write 
Now this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and it is he who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, I have no right to come into the throne of grace, no right at the throne of God, except by the atoning sacrifice for my sin, and not only for mine, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, we aren't given to depend upon our own worthiness to save us. We aren't left to fend for ourselves, to be kept by ourselves. It is not my job to give me eternal life, to make a way for my eternal redemption. It is simply required of me that I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the other work has been done. All the other sacrifice has been made because he has finished that work for us. If we depend upon him, he is our advocate at the throne of grace. And fifthly, I believe that God came so that the work of Satan could be destroyed in my life. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, and that is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now I'm kind of like the old guy who said, I'm ready, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go. But if you're getting up a busload today, I'm just not sure about it. <laughs> well, I'm not. You know, I love life. God has instilled within me the same thing he's instilled with you. The same thing that he has instilled with all of, in, into all of us. The value of the love of the life that he has blessed us with. And I love my life on this old sin-cursed world. I'll have to say I do. But if my time comes today, I do not leave here with fear and dread. Because I know that the atoning grace of Jesus Christ is going to lead me into the hallowed halls of glory. Are you afraid to die? Are you afraid that if you die today, where you might spend eternity? Are you afraid because you really have no relationship with God to Christ Jesus? Are you uncertain about your future? Do you not know where you're going? That is the work of Satan in your life. That is the work of the author of doubt and fear, the power that sin has over our lives. And God came in the form of Jesus that he might break that power of sin if only we believe in him and receive him. Do you live today with the burden of sin weighing upon your shoulders? Do you carry that weight of sin every day uncertain and fearful. I want to tell you about somebody today that's broken the bond of that fear and what you have to do to get that breaking, uh, to, to cause him to break that bond over you is believe on him and trust that he can do it because he came to destroy that work in you. He came to destroy that bond of fear. He came to destroy and to deliver you from those chains of fear, that work of fear, and final destruction. And finally, I think he came to destroy something that we all have a sense of dread about, and that is death. He came that death as our enemy might be conquered. You may see me someday laid out cold as a cucumber, but you can say this, he's not dead, he lives. Because the only thing I will do in those last moments when this life draws its final breath is I simply will leave here and go to the presence of the one who gave himself for me that I might spend eternity in the presence of my creator. John chapter 11 verse 25. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life and he who believes in me 
Though he die, he shall live. And Paul writes these words to his beloved Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But, I, I just want you to hear again that there, there is a but every time in the course of the work of Jesus Christ. There is a condemnation of sin, but there is the grace of Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, death, where is your sting? It is swallowed up in the victory of that one who died for me. If there's a sad part to the way we celebrate Christmas, I think it's that most really have no idea what Christmas is really all about. If someone had asked you today, is, is, what's Christmas about? Would you have mentioned any of these things today? Because this is exactly what the coming of Christ is about. It's about God becoming a man. It's about a story of suffering and death and heartache and, and tragedy so that evil could be defeated. It's a story about victory over death, hell, and the grave. It's a story about victory over Satan. It's a story about my redemption and the glorious future that I possess because of that one who came. And you understand when I use that personal pronoun, I hope that you can sit there and use that same pronoun. I hope that you can sing that same song of victory. It is my story of redemption that this coming of Christ tells. And we're at the forefront of those who proclaim that story this morning, that Christ was born of a virgin, that Christ lived a sinless life, that Christ died on the cross for the sins of mankind, that Christ rose from the grave, and that Christ is coming again very soon. The gift that God has given to all of mankind is the gift of His Son, the gift of salvation. He's made it available to all of us just for the taking, just for the believing, just for the trusting, that one who does not receive this wonderful gift someday is going to regret it. If you've never received this wonderful gift this morning, I encourage you, seek it, believe on it. It is yours for the taking. It is a present of, of unmatched beauty and magnitude, and it is yours. All you have to do is accept it. This morning, I could point to each one of you and say, for unto us, unto you, unto you, a child is born. Unto you, a son is given. The gift of eternal life. If you've never accepted that gift this morning, I want you to know that it's yours. You can have it, but you have to accept it. And you have to publicly profess that it is yours, that you accept it. And that's very little by comparison to all that Christ did to make your redemption sure and sound. Or maybe you need to come and recommit your life to him this morning because of um, you, you realize the, the beauty and the magnitude uh, of what he has done for you. And you want to come and recommit your life. As our musicians come and uh, begin now to sing our closing hymn, maybe you need to come for church membership. Maybe you need to come... Um, because God is calling you to be a part of this old institution, to serve him here in this community, whatever your need is. God bless you. Come. Come, Brother Sean. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Let us stand and sing 243 Emmanuel. Emmanuel.